Hey everyone, so it's time for another Code Review Unplugged episode. And today I'm gonna look at um, some code that Carl has sent me. So uh, this is actually a really cool project because it's, um, um, yeah, it is a, a security, a tutorial for fixing and, I well, identifying and fixing security vulnerabilities in a tiny Flask web app. And um, I, I really like this. Uh, it's, it's not a lot of code, so you know, should be relatively easy for for people to go through this. But I, I kind of like you know the short and sweet description here, and um, uh, I, I like the fact that that it's trying to teach people something with code and actually making them do something. So I think this would be great for a little workshop. Or I don't really know where this where this comes from. If this if Carl, you know, if you were doing this at um, uh, at a company or some kind of public workshop, but I really like the idea and you should definitely keep going. Like, I, I think it's a really, really cool way to teach people. Um, so yeah, so all I did so far was uh, pull this up in GitHub and then also um, just clone the repo locally. Let's also open that up in Sublime Text. Uh, maybe crank down the font size a bit and um, yeah, cool. So, so what I really like here is that the README is, is pretty extensive and you know just kind of contains all you need. Um, I am not a hundred percent clear what version of Python we're dealing with. Like just looking at the requirements txt file. It's great that we have a requirements txt file, by the way. So it's using uh, the Flask module and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and it, it looks like we're supposed to just install this globally. So uh, with this, like I typically, I wouldn't recommend um, installing these things globally unless it's like a tool like a linter or something you, you need all the time. So usually I would not in install new Python libraries and modules with uh, sudo pip install. But like what I would do, I'm just gonna assume this is Python 3 and we'll see what happens. Like I would create a new virtual environment with the pi vnf command. And then I'm gonna activate that with this other command. And I actually have a shortcut here in my um, shell setup, so I can just do de to deactivate a vnf and ae to activate one. Maybe I should crank up the font size a bit too. So I was just saying like I can do DE and then AE to activate and deactivate these VNFs. And like a, a virtual ENV is essentially a local copy of your Python environment so that when you install new modules, um, they don't gum up your global Python install, but they're localized to just this folder. So like you, we can look into this with LS and you know, you can see that um, here we actually have uh, a tiny, well, almost like a tiny Python install here, right? Like with a bin folder and a library folder and, and all of that. So look into Python virtual ENVs and then if, because this is a tutorial for, for newbies, like I would potentially consider, you know, teaching them about um, virtual ENVs because in the long run, they're probably not gonna be happy installing these uh, requirements into their global Python install. So I'm gonna do here, um, just install the requirements. Great that you have a uh, requirements file here. It's always, always great because it just makes setting up this stuff a lot easier. <laughs> um, and you've pinned your requirements to, to fix versions. That's great too. Okay, so now I guess I'm, yeah, I'm probably not gonna play through the whole tutorial, but I wanna make sure I can run the tests and kind of um, also maybe spin up the app so we can make sure it's it's running. Okay, so let's go Python app, not pi. Okay, cool. Looks like it's running. <laughs> nice. I like the green. Sweet. Seems to work. Let's try emoji. Works too. Excellent. Um, no Unicode errors. No, um, Cool, so it looks like this is running. Let's try uh, Let's try and make sure we get the tests running as well. So that's usually what I try to do with a, with a new project, just to make sure I can run the tests as well. So 
Okay, so it looks like there's no instructions on how to run the tests. So maybe we, the way we can figure that out is uh, we'll just look at the tests and then, yeah, we can see it's a script file or it, it does this like imports unit test and just calls unit test main. So it looks like we can just run this like a regular Python script and then tests pass. Cool, so it looks like we got this running. So why don't we take a look at the code now? And I'm gonna do this um, in Sublime Text. I think it's gonna be a better environment to do that in. Okay, like I said, the requirements look good. Let's look at app.py. Okay, so this is like a tiny um, Flask app. Um, yeah, we have got this global posts here. I mean, I think for an example like that, that's totally fine um, that we're not doing any kind of persistence. So I'm not gonna focus on that. Um, okay, so maybe the first thing that actually catches my eye is that these comments here, they could be doc strings. Um, so just to show you what a doc string is, it's like when you do these three like typically the convention would be, it could be any old string, as long as it's like the first thing that happens in your in your function. But like typically would, you would format them like this. And then this would be the doc string. And uh, the cool thing about doc strings is that they're treated um, a little bit special by the Python, uh, Python parser um, or the Python runtime because um, these doc strings are actually accessible, um, you know, through, um, um, from from within the program, and um, that means there are a lot of tools around that allow you to generate uh, documentation based on these doc strings, and so it's just like good practice to you know not have these kind of inline comments for doc strings. Just kind of use proper doc strings. Just because I'm seeing that here everywhere, like you're really des describing the function. I think that's that's great, uh, and that's that's the right way to go about it. Um, but you probably want to put that information into a doc string and not just into a um, an inline comment. So that's probably what I would change. I'm here with the output. Uh, I mean, I think I think that's fine too because you you just you know you want to do this like minimal minimal example here. Um, obviously, like for a larger app or whatever, like this would be loaded from from some kind of template file and probably be handled through um a proper templating system also to avoid stuff like this where we're just concatenating and, and i know you know this is part of the the challenge here so i don't want to spoil that for people but like you know it could really easily like inject all kinds of stuff like inject a script tag or do something else like that and and there's no like validation for that but that but that's part of the the game like that's part of the whole tutorial right so that's i, I really like that well done um yeah, in terms of you know how you're formatting um, this small app, like I think it looks good. Like it's it's nice to read. It's like formatted consistently. Honestly, the only thing I really saw was the the doc strings here. Um, so yeah, I can't really complain about that. And then for the unit tests, I think this works well too. You know, again, like in terms of the the formatting, like maybe one tiny thing, like I'm seeing that you've switched your quote types, you know, you're using double quotes down here and then single quotes there. But um, that's something that, that personally, like I, I would, I would change that for consistency. But I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a big deal. Um, uh, and one, like one way you can you can deal with that is um, just by having syntax highlighting that actually highlights them differently. I mean, if you wanna if you wanna go for consistency, right? Then then you would need that. If you don't want to, then it doesn't really matter. But anyway, okay. So probably change that um, in terms of how the tests or what the tests look like. I think that makes sense. To um, based on what you're doing, I don't think it makes sense to pull in like you know something like web test, um, which is like a bigger framework for testing these kinds of uh, web apps. Which you know it, it really helps when you're working on a larger project. But like for what you're doing with this tutorial, I think it it is great that you're keeping the dependencies simple and just kind of focused on 
well, basically Flask, right? So um, actually with this stuff, what I would probably do here in terms of the dependencies, um, I would probably just put in Flask as a dependency. And then it, it's not really necessary to like spec out all these other ones because then it becomes really clear what the real dependencies are because all of this other stuff um, is presumably getting pulled in by Flask, like Jinja, that's a templating thing and, and all that stuff. And, and worked. So it's like this, the underlying um, libraries that Flask is built on top of. But um, on the other hand, if you do, you, you know, if you do like a pip freeze, then, um, then that's like the classical way to freeze your dependency. So, you know, because this is a tutorial, I, I might think about like just having Flask there so that people who are looking at it, they can realize like, oh, you know, all we're really using here is Flask, which I might be like a valuable, um, well, I don't want to say lesson, but like a valuable piece of information for people. But like, honestly, like, you know, this is super nitpicky what I'm, what I'm saying there. Um, yeah, I got some CSS there. Yeah, it's pretty self-contained. I mean, arguably we could also serve the CSS in line here, um, but yeah, that doesn't that doesn't really matter matter. Um, we've got a Git ignore, which I think is is great. Uh, it's gonna you know it's gonna make sure that people who submit pull requests and stuff for for um, your your app here uh, are not gonna hopefully not gonna commit like all kinds of crazy files that you didn't have to sort out. Um, yeah, I, I think this is pretty cool. Like honestly, like there's not a lot of stuff I could uh, I could find here. Um, and I really like the tutorial. So anyone who's watching this, like try and play through the tutorial. Tutorial, I think it'll it'll probably teach you some some valuable things about um, avoiding some of these vulnerabilities. Like I'm hoping there's some kind of solution sheet for that. I think it would be great if that was there because I really like the idea behind this tutorial. And um, yeah, like I think we're we're ready to wrap this up. Um, please write a longer blog post about the tutorial. I think it's a really good idea. Cool. Thanks, Carl, and good luck.